The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond and platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Right on. So, uh, like, we'll go ahead and get like get started here. Hope everybody had a good lunch. Um, wanted to thank uh, like David and Mark uh, from Cloud.com for having me out here for this. Um, glad I could be here. Like, my name is Garrett Honeycutt. I'm a professional services consultant with Puppet Labs. Uh, so that means I get to come to like Linux Fest and talk about Puppet, uh, do public trainings as well as uh, actually work and do consulting. Um, our company's based out of Portland. I'm based out of Indianapolis. I'm a r r remote worker. Um, I thought, thought we'd start off today with uh, doing, like talking about uh, Puppet and configuration management in general, and then moving on to do a demo. Uh, like, how many people here use some kind of configuration management tool now? To manage their systems. Okay, so a few folks. How many of uh, those people have used Puppet before? Okay, so intro talk is a good choice. <laughs> so uh, I think it makes sense in the be begin talking about why configuration management in general, um, and then and then I'll go into more of like how Puppet works and what's going on there. Um, well, you really can't read that at all. Um, <laughs> thanks. So, uh, like what I often hear uh, is what I call the one-off myth, is that my systems are unique snowflakes and there, there's just a one-off, you know. Why should I invest time in configuration management for this one system? Um, I call it a myth, so obviously I'm not a, a believer of the one-off. So the first reason I hear is that my host is only temporary. Uh, how many people have deployed temporary hosts uh, before? Yeah, those like still on your network? Uh, I know all the, uh, all the really old crusty hosts that I see at places when I ask people about, they're like, yeah, that was a temporary host to fix something. Uh, obviously once you build something and put it out, there for people to use, people rely on it. You can't just take systems back uh, or services back. So I don't think that only temporary ever holds up. Um, and second is uh, replicas for pre-production environments. I mean, if you build something out once, uh, don't you also want to have, you know, like a dev and a QA, et cetera, like versions of your systems? Hopefully you're not just building out production systems and you know, writing all your code on the servers that they run on and stuff, right? Like, let, like you have some sort of QA process. Um, this is a big one for folks. I mean, uh, th like think about all the troubles that you've had because dev didn't look just like QA and QA didn't look just like prod and you're like, well, it worked in this environment. Why, didn't it, why did it suddenly catch on fire when I released it? Um, and a lot of times it happens because your environments aren't the same. And so configuration management is really going to help you keep everything uh, actually the same so you don't have those hidden surprises when you go to deploy. Um, and the next is disaster recovery. I mean, if, if the system was important enough for you to spend any time on to build once, isn't it important enough uh, to rebuild when the system fails? I mean, all, all systems fail. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Uh, so if it was important enough to do once, don't you want it to be around after it fails? Um, the thing that I don't have a bullet up here for is that oftentimes as admins, we're, we're rushed into doing work. And uh, a lot of times we, we like to say yes and don't really push back enough. And like what happens is we end up building these things that we're not really proud of. Uh, we rush through it. And then even worse, when they break, because we didn't do it right, suddenly it's, it's, it's our fault, uh, it makes us look bad, and then we're the ones that have to fix it at 3 a.m. So 
while there's definitely a, a bit higher cost in the beginning of using any configuration management tool, I think the benefits are, are huge to being able to build things that are repeatable uh, and that you can be like proud of and not have to fix at 3 a.m. Um, like the whole reason I actually got started with configuration management, uh, I was uh, using Puppet in 2007 to build a nationwide VoIP-like platform. And so I had uh, you know, systems that had to be up all the time. This is like real-time voice traffic. I did deploy in multiple uh, like locations, lots of pre-production environments, and I knew that I just couldn't do it without configuration management. So I looked at what was available, uh, started using Puppet, and it very quickly was managing things in my infrastructure. Um, before uh, we had Puppet, what I'm, I was uh, like the last line of escalation, and so problems would come to me and I couldn't escalate further, I had to fix them. And generally problems came to me at three in the morning uh, when I didn't want to be dealing with problems. So my only goal in life was really to build things that were repeatable, uh, and that were well documented, and that wouldn't have uh, the knock like, like calling me at, at all hours because things were, were down. Uh, that was a big like motivating factor for me. And through like using Puppet, um, we were able to get ahead of the curve of something's on fire, go fix this, go fix that. Uh, I mean, that's really a crappy place to be in. And, that, and I think it's where a lot of admins are, is you're not a, a proactive uh, part of your team. You're always like reacting. Something's breaking, something's going on. And, and so these sort of tools helped our team get ahead of that curve to where instead of just reacting to things, we were able to build out like new things and we're actually able to go to product and say, hey, we've got these new things we can sell that we can build, you know, which is a lot more fun than just uh, reacting to fires. Sort of got on top, off topic from the, uh, like the one off. Uh, the next, this is my, uh, my goofy looking cloud picture, uh, is uh, hosts, hosts on demand. I mean, so you can swipe your credit card and have 10,000 machines uh, up okay, like how do you manage them, right? Like how do you ensure uh, that the changes that you want to institute across them are being done properly? I mean, if you're using images alone for this, uh, I'm sure you've hit, hit, like hit a wall with uh, image sprawl and having to you know, update these like golden systems. It doesn't, it doesn't scale. Um, another reason for config management is to reduce entropy. Uh, like how many folks here have deployed clustered systems? Yeah, and so uh, those folks, uh, uh, like did you use configuration management? Yeah, okay, so I've deployed lots of clusters without config management and uh, I'm guessing you'll have uh, a similar thing is that after time, sure they're all mail servers but they're not all quite doing the same thing, right? Because you, like you were updating them by hand, maybe you updated some because there was some problem, they have different revs of software, and so now they're all like on the cover, you know, they're all doing sort of the same thing, but they're not really the same machine. Um, I would see this a lot where our mail systems would have characteristics of their own, they'd have their own personalities. You're like, you know, why is mail 27 why is it Q always large and the rest of them aren't really things like that. So having configuration management actually lets you have systems that are actually the same and so it's gonna reduce that entropy that grows and grows. Um, disaster recovery, we talked about the importance of that. And then like change management. I mean, how do you manage change across your systems? Uh, so like building out a system, okay, you built a system, but then you have to uh, update and upkeep that system. And so t t to do that, like, like you have to be able to properly take those changes, g get them tested in pre-production environments, and then like rolled out to your production environments. Uh, if, you, if you're doing that without configuration management, your change management is, is probably uh, like giving you problems. Um, b before I started to use Puppet, uh, so, like some of you folks might be familiar with this, like change approval boards. 
where perhaps you have to go in front of people and explain why you're going to make changes. Um, we got a ton of scrutiny because change events didn't like didn't always like go well. Um, after we started like using Puppet, suddenly the need for the, everyone to say no, you can't make changes, no, you can't make changes left because our maintenance events went really smooth, and so it was it was easy when you don't break things to get people to let you to change things more often. Uh, and infrastructure as code. Uh, that's sort of a buzzword going around, but the idea behind this is that uh, you're modeling all of your infrastructure as code, and so since, since it is code, you can use the tools that you already use uh, to deal with code. So you can version control your infrastructure. You can use tools like diff to see what changed in my infrastructure uh, by looking at the code. Um, you can do things like continuous integration to see when uh, people c make new changes to your infrastructure, you know, is it going to break things? Um, so Puppet itself is open source. Uh, we are uh, Apache V2. Um, this slide is a little bit old. I think there's like 4,000 or so people on the mailing list now. Um, 400 or so people at all times on IRC. So if you're looking for help, IRC is great. So is the mailing list. Um, we come packaged with uh, the major like distros. And we have a lot of people contributing code uh, to the project. So while Puppet Labs uh, does, does help you know, point the project, it's, it's, it's not just people like working there. This is definitely a very vibrant uh, community. Uh, we released uh, recently Puppet Enterprise, which is our enterprise like level software. I promise this isn't a sales spiel, but it's new and people like want to hear about it. Um, the ones in blue are operating systems that we have support for or will soon release for. Um, and the ones in orange are not, are things that Puppet like runs on, but not PE. Yeah. So what Puppet Enterprise is, is basically we, we take all the components of Puppet and we package them for you. Uh, and we do it in a way that's scalable and in line with best practices. I mean, Puppet's just a web app. So you could run it with Mongrel, Unicorn, reverse proxies with Apache, Apache Passenger, Nginx. There's like a million different ways that you could like set it up. Um, so we just pick the one that's going to be the most like scalable and durable. Um, it's a fully like QA stack and it's totally encapsulated. So like a problem that people have is that you have to have a certain version of Ruby or Apache or something to make Puppet work in your environment, but then you also need some other version of Ruby for your app. And so we, we encapsulate everything by using specific packages for our stuff and putting everything under ops like Puppet. So our Ruby is not going to interfere with your Ruby. You don't have to be on the same upgrade schedule. So it sort of takes some uh, of the headache out. Uh, in the future, uh, like what we have uh, like coming is a set of commonly used like modules. Uh, currently, you can go to the forge, uh, forge.puppetlabs.com, and get code that's already written to make uh, Puppet work for you. And so we're going to be like releasing more of that with <coughs> PE. Um, and then integration with M Collective. So like, Puppet's pervasive, so if you're not using Puppet, you're definitely not a guinea pig. It's not anything new. I mean, I started in 2007, and now we have customers like Disney, uh, Zynga, uh, New York Stock Exchange. Uh, one customer we found out at FOSDEM, which I thought was cool that isn't up here, is the air traffic control uh, for Germany, like uses this. I think is like pretty neat. So like going to how Puppet works, um, Puppet's a declarative uh, like language. It's its uh, own DSL. So if you don't know Ruby uh, or something, that's that's okay. Uh, the DSL is really easy, and we'll get into what that like looks like. And so we're going to define what the state of our system like should be through code, uh, and then we can 
uh, simulate what that is going to look like. So this is great for your maintenance events because you can run Puppet in a simulation mode with uh, dash dash uh, a no op. And so you could actually see what changes would take place without actually doing them, which is uh, great. So you can see what, what, what would happen before you shoot yourself in the foot across all your nodes. Um, and then you can actually enforce uh, that. So you can enforce that the state of your system is in the state you want it to be in. Uh, and anytime you do that, a report gets like kicked off so that you can log and know like what changed and like look back. <laughs> Go into each of these. So like we define how uh, the systems work through writing modules. And so this is the actual code that, that you would write or download from the forge. And so we have different types of modules that like you would get. And then you would assign those modules through what I call like a node decode relationship where you say this node runs these modules. So you'd say, you know, my web server like maybe runs the Apache module. My database like server runs the MySQL module. And they all uh, run the security modules and things like that. Um, and that's where you associate that code with the different nodes. Um, so like how it uh, works is that you have your blank hardware, or this could be lack of a VM. Uh, you have your provisioning system, which makes your base install. Uh, and then Puppet, from that point, is going to configure the system into its role. But it's also going to maintain that role. So if you're not using configuration management, you probably have, up to this point, like figured out. Like you have blank hardware, you provision, and then you configure. So this might be something like a, a kickstart uh, does it. Then you have some post section which runs your scripts and maybe you know your big pile of Perl and like whatever you use to get the system going. But that's where most people stop, right? So you just build a system, but now it's not being maintained, uh, which isn't super useful. Um, so some some best practice, and this is configuration management agnostic, is this base install should be the same across your systems, and it should be a minimal system. So the minimal of what it is to be a node on your network should be in your base install, as opposed to having different base installs for your web server versus your database server, things like that. So you want uh, all those uh, to be as, as minimal as possible, and then you're going to describe on top of that with your configuration management tool to model uh, the rest of the system. And so, like here we have your desired state, and so this is what the system should, uh, like should look like. And what invariably happens is that the system starts to drift out of that state. And that could be through an admin comes and makes a change that's not through the configuration management tool. It could be a security breach, it could just be uh, a process died, and so you want your web server to be running, but it's not. Uh, so now you're in this other state, and Puppet uh, like runs, and basically does a diff between what does the system look like and what is the system uh, like supposed to look like, and then it's going to converge back onto that. And anytime it does a convergence, it sends a, a report off. So this could be something as simple as saying. Uh, my Etsy sudoers file should have mode 0400. And so that's your state of the system. And then somehow it gets changed to 0644. Well, that's not right. So it brings it into convergence and it just changes the mode back because maybe that's the only thing that's changed. So like we talk about like data flow between the nodes. Um, all of the uh, uh, traffic is SSL encrypted, and we use certs for authentication. Uh, and it starts off where you have a node, and the node is going to send information, uh, facts about itself to the master. The master then takes those and creates a catalog. This is the state of the system uh, that it's supposed to be in. Sends the catalog to the node, which is going to like process it and basically do the diff and say, Hey, does the catalog, like, do I look like what the catalog says I'm supposed to look like? If not, let's make the changes. And then it sends a report on to the Puppet Master. Um, so facts, uh, sorry, 
ühel. I would do all the changes through configuration management and then run that code base against one system and see if it did what you wanted it to do and then you could run that code base against your other systems. Yeah. Um, fax, uh, automatically maintained asset inventory. So this is uh, real time information on your systems. And facts are just uh, key values. And that was probably kind of hard to read back there. But it just has a key of some information and then a value for it. Uh, um, like how many people here code Ruby? Right on, so a small number of hands. Um, uh, oh, and all of, all of these facts you can access as top, top level scope like variables within your code. So now I can make, uh, like programmatically, I can make decisions based on the values of these. So one might be, let's say I'm running a Tomcat system and I want to allocate, allocate heap size uh, based on the total memory of the system. I could look at uh, total like memory size here and then use like logic, you know, like a case statement, if statement or something and set the heap size of Tomcat based on the size of memory on my system, uh, for instance. So now I'm, I'm, I'm programmatically and dynamically like doing things uh, instead of having to know about all that stuff. Wow, you really can't read that. Um, so custom facts, I don't code Ruby. I've been using Puppet since 2007. Uh, it hasn't slowed me down any. Um, this is hard to read, but basically you can have Ruby exec scripts. So if you can code in a different language, bash or the language of your choice, you can still make your own custom facts and it's easy to do. Um, so the next is the catalog. And so that's gonna be a comprehensive resource list of your system and it's easily validated for compliance requirements. Um, like does anyone here deal with uh, compliance like SOX, uh, PCI, HIPAA, things like that? Yeah. Uh, one of the folks that works with us was able to, the, he had uh, some PCI uh, audit and so he was able to actually give them the puppet code uh, and they were excited to get that as part of the audit because then they could see like what was going on. And the next is reporting. Uh, reporting is comprehensive of every change ever made and correlated to the resource uh, that, you, that you're managing. So the resource could be a user, it could be a file, a service, all sorts of things. Um, and then it's easily validated against compliance. Um, different ways you can send reports, uh, HTTP, uh, syslog, RD graphs, you can store the YAML. Uh, tag mail is, is fun because you can tag parts of your code and when they change, the log entry is sent via email. So something you could do with this is, let's say you have a, a security uh, like policy that says you can't SSH as root to your systems. So like pretty common. Um, you could manage the, your SSHD uh, config file you know, ensure you can't, like you can't do that. And then if that file ever changes, and someone turns it on so you can SSH as root, Puppet's gonna go and fix it and put it back. But now it can send an email to your security team and say, hey, like this happened. And then so you, like you have logging of the incident, you know when the incident was fixed. And if you had the last Puppet run, like, like you could tell a window when you were out of compliance, which is cool. And if you have an email based like ticketing system, now Puppet can auto generate like tickets for you when it sees things that aren't right on your network. Um, 
Here's a, a picture. Again, like the lighting isn't great for this, but what's going on here with our dashboard? This is a web-based like GUI, and it gives you simple red and green output of you know are things good or are they failing? And then you can also do things like look at compile time to sort of get some metrics uh, for how your puppet master is doing. Um, what Puppet does is that I like is that it, it talks about what, not how. Is, is, is there any way you can bring the lights down in the front up there so people can read the slides? Um, I think there might be buttons next to you if we're going to try smashing on those. Nope. There we go. Like, can people read what's up there now? Is that better? Yeah? Okay. So, what I initially was, was really excited about with uh, by using Puppet is that I talk about what and not how. So I think it's like, like pretty easy to read this. I've, I've got a package. Its name is NTP, and I want it to be installed. Um, so that's, that's like easy to work with. I didn't have to know some other programming language to make it happen. Um, and notice I don't say run apt get, I don't say run yum, you know, I don't say run package add, I just say I want the package. Um, so this is the code that you would like write in and the puppet master doesn't know uh, what system the, the, the end node is and, and, and it doesn't care. It's up to the end node to figure out how to get packages on its, on its system you know, like which, like what software, like do I use to make that happen? Uh, like this is great because at the end of the day, um, when you're building systems and modeling systems, do you really care what flags you have to p pass the user add or add user or whatever? Uh, no, like you want to build services, not get caught up in the uh, like details. Um, this just lists. Um, the providers, which is how the, the, the agents know how to do that. And so an agent will say, I'm a Red Hat system, so I'm going to use Yum, or I'm a Debian system, I'm going to use Apt. And so it'll just do the right thing to get packages or users or like whatever onto the system. Some example resource types we have, um, probably the ones we use the most, cron exec file package and service. Uh, when, when, when we're talking about uh, like, like Unix machines, these are generally the things we're talking about. Um, like you might talk about hosts or mounts or ZFS, like things like that. And this is, uh, isn't a comprehensive list, this is just a small, small one. And then you can create your own resource types. Um, Puppet's again a declarative language and not a procedural one. Uh, so I love it in that I, I, I model what my system should look like, as opposed to write, you know, scripts that say do this, do this, do this, um, which doesn't scale. Um, so the the most common design pattern that we have is the package file service design pattern. So normally, when we're installing software, you install a package, you twiddle some knobs through config files. And then at the end of it, you, if you twiddle the knobs right, like your service starts up, right? And so this, this, this design pattern, like the most common, what we're saying here is that we have a package NTP, we want it installed. We have a file ntp.conf, and it requires the package. So uh, Puppet does have the sense of ordering, like built in. So, and to do that, you have to specify relationships between your resources. Um, that's how you can ensure that the package happens before the config file, right? So you have to get the config file from somewhere. Uh, and then you have a service NTP that you want to be running, and it's going to subscribe to this file. So if this file ever changes, then your service will get like notified and hopped. Um, so if this is the only thing you can do with Puppet, you can still do a ton uh, in terms of like managing your infrastructure. Uh, Puppet allows for file serving, so it uses this Puppet like URI uh, to serve up files. Um, 
we're talking about adding BitTorrent support for large files, which would be cool. Um, and then we also have like templates uh, for, t for, for templates. We didn't reinvent the wheel. We just use like Ruby's ERB engine uh, for templating. And so here we're taking uh, like variables and putting those in a, a template. So this is actually the first uh, code that I wrote with, uh, like with Puppet was to model my MOTD. And uh, within a few minutes I had Puppet like going and doing stuff. So there's more advanced like templates that you can do. Uh, you can have inline Ruby and ERB files. You can do all sorts of stuff. This is a simple one for a resolve conf. So here we have like a search path and then this is essentially like a for loop over an array of name servers. And so it's going to print all those out for your resolver. So just to like demonstrate, you know, like what you can do with uh, like templates. Um, there's also uh, like syntax checking. Um, I uh, would strongly encourage that people do syntax checking as pre-commit hooks to their version control system. Uh, you can commit code that's syntactically correct and still does dumb things. It's like it's not going to stop you from that, but like you should at least do syntax checks to ensure that you're not accepting code that's that's just you know like broken from the get-go into your version control. Um, something that people like generally like bring up is how to change. How do the nodes become aware of each uh, of each other, and how do you pass data between nodes? Because so far we just talked about uh, nodes in the Puppet Master, and so to get data between nodes, we use a database as a proxy. Um, the database is uh, the standard ones you'd expect to see. We generally do MySQL uh, or SQLite by default. Um, and how it works is that one node can export a resource, so that'll get shoved into the, the database, and then these other nodes can realize those like resources. So I've seen people do this with with host entries, so that they can have like a host file that's up to date. Uh, but I think more exciting is like uh, SSH keys for hosts, so every every node can export its SSH key, and then every other node can can like realize those. And then you can enforce that only the ones that you explicitly declare are in your known host file. And so people can't just add things in there. Um, we also have support for uh, something we call an ENC, an external node, uh, external node classifier. And you can use our Puppet dashboard, which is the web-based like GUI, or you can use your own systems. And so Let's say you already have a database of all your hosts and IP information and things like that, or you have some management tool that was written 10 years ago in Tickle and Perl, and it's not leaving your organization. Uh, but well, you can still interface with that. Uh, to do it, you just have a script that takes the cert name, which is uh, like the name of the node, as an argument, and then it just outputs like YAML to standard out. And so this could be as simple as, let's say you already have a database that has all your node information. You might have like rack location or things like that. You could add a, a couple more like columns for what classes and what variables should be uh, associated like with that node. And then just do a SQL like lookup and output it to YAML. So this is just to show that Puppet's like really hackable and you can get it to work in your infrastructure. So this is uh, a common uh, node like declaration of what the code would look like, where we have uh, some node, and we have a few variables, and then we're doing this node to code relationship where we're saying this system is going to have the common class, the puppet class, the DNS class, and NTP class. And so this is what it would look like in YAML output. So if your script can do that, then you can uh, use uh, assets that you already have. Um, I've got a demo to go through about using this with EC2. Like, does anyone have uh, like questions?
Yeah. Uh, I have not used Blueprint myself, but uh, so Blueprint is software that uses Puppet uh, to identify what the state of the system is. Right. Yeah. Um, I haven't I haven't used it myself. Uh, I generally like to build systems new, uh, which isn't always you know something you can do or you have to do like forensics to figure out well how do I build the new system. So tools like that are good to help you like do that. So it doesn't use SSH, it uses SSL encryption and search for authentication. And yeah, you have to install software on each of the nodes. Okay, so, so there is a client that, that's installing node before it can communicate. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, by default, uh, it runs a daemon that wakes up every 30 minutes, checks in with the master, gets its, uh, its catalog, and then makes a change if necessary. Um, you can also run Puppet out of cron, uh, which is what a lot of folks do. Um, this is good, so like people like the New York Stock Exchange, what they do is they say, there's not gonna be any changes to our systems during trading hours. Uh, so obviously that's, that's, that's when it's real important that everything's up, right? And so uh, Puppet doesn't run during, like, during trading hours and then after that, it runs in a no-op mode. So if any changes were made to those systems, they get logged into reporting, and then a change approval board can say, hey, were these changes supposed to be there? What's going on with them? Uh, and then they can run Puppet in uh, that, the enforcing mode during a maintenance window. Yeah. So definitely different uh, options you have for like running Puppet. Uh, also with that, you can run, uh, with, with the Puppet Daemon, you, you can put a splay uh, in there to splay the time so you don't have Thundering Herd where everything wakes up right at, you know, the 30 minutes on the dot and they all like check in at once. In Cron, what people do is wrap uh, a, a, a random sleep so that not all the things are waking up at the same time. Uh, like any other questions? Uh, so like not, not, not directly, uh, although I've used Puppet to manage Spacewalk, and I use Spacewalk in conjunction with Puppet, but they're not like glued to each other. No. Yeah, it's actually good that you like bring up, so uh, for folks especially that use Puppet now, you can specify versions of packages in your Puppet code which I think is uh, not a good practice. Um, and instead I would uh, have people manage their repositories. So tools like Spacewalk are great for that uh, so that your systems aren't connecting to the internet to get packages. They're getting them from your repositories and you're managing what's, like, what's uh, like there within them. It's like good practice. Um, Folks like to see the demo. We'll go on to that. Or do you have more more questions? Cool. Let's see. Wow. Uh, Unfortunately, I think, uh, I think we should skip the demo because you can't read what's on my screen, uh, which makes it, it's gonna make it hard for me to show you. Cool. Can people read what's going on here? Um, maybe.
Is that better? Can people read that? Okay. There we go. Sweet. Maybe we can go down one size. Can people still read this? To get more than like five characters to go across would be helpful. Um, cool, so what, like what I'll do for uh, like this demo, I just provisioned uh, two machines in EC2 and uh, we're gonna install Puppet Enterprise on both of them and then manage a Java deployment so you can see what that would look like. Um, so the Puppet Enterprise is a textual installer, but we are a company of automation, so you can feed it an answers file. Uh, I'm gonna do it interactively just so you can see what's there. Uh, it lets me install a Puppet Master um, by default, uh, your nodes are going to look for uh, a host called Puppet on, on your domain. And so what folks will do is add a system and then add like a C name to that host. We're going to go ahead and turn on dashboard and use it as an external node classifier. Up. Doesn't actually do anything till the end, like luckily. So like, like you can see as this uh, does the install that the packages will all be prefixed with PE. So that way we have our own versions of uh, tools that we're installing. Uh, so that way it doesn't clash with your versions that are out there. Right on. Yes, yeah, so you can see everything's prefixed with PE. And this is a feature of Puppet Enterprise. Right on, so we can see it's setting up uh, uh, the dashboard for us. Uh, and setting up SQL. So now it says it's, it's done and ready to go. Um, so we're gonna set up Puppet on another node and see how, how that works. But first let's uh, connect to the dashboard. Um, so for that I just have an SSH uh, by tunnel that's going to tunnel to the system. So if you're not familiar with SSH tunnels, uh, it's a good way to get around those proxies that work in school. Um, but this is what's going on, just creating a, uh, a local port 3000 that's connected to port 3000 on the local machine. Um, So this is connecting on my 3G connection. So uh, I was having trouble with the wireless here. So it might be a little uh, slow for us. But I see, uh, there we go. So it doesn't know about any nodes yet, so we'll go ahead and run Puppet on the Puppet system.
Cool. So we see we've, we've got a node in there and everything's green or kind of green on this display. But we can go in there and, and see uh, the status of it, what's going on. So let's uh, add another node. We'll add the node that's going to run Tomcat. So I believe it's it's dash s. We can create an answers file. So we're going to go through and create an, an answers file where we don't want to install a master because we already have one. We already have a dashboard. We want symbolic links and user local bins. So what that did was created this file. And so this file is going to be evaluated uh, with bash, or actually with uh, shell. And so all these just get set as variables that, that the install script is going to use. So if you're doing this for deployments, what folks like generally do is cert, like cert name. Uh, they'll have back ticks, and then you'll put like host name dash f. And that way, your system will evaluate that and have its own name in there, not one that's hard coded. Then we'll go ahead and install from the answers file. So normally the install from the answers file, I, I would have done uh, like as a, a post part of your provisioning step. Um, so if you were using like kickstart in your post section, you might wget uh, the script that's gonna uh, like grab the, the tarball in the answers file unpack the tarball and run it with the answers file for you as like part of your provisioning. So like when this machine ran, it's it submitted a cert request to the master. So I can run puppet cert list and that'll show me uh, outstanding systems to be signed. Or I can do all and show all my, all my certs. So Tomcat still needs to be signed. So there's ways to work around this with automation as well so that you don't have this manual step of signing your certs and it really depends on uh, your security constraints. So you can turn on auto signing and so any host that connects it will automatically be signed. So I would only do this if you're on a, a trusted like network and so you, like you have other like mechanisms that keep hosts from getting on that network that you're using. Uh, you can also pre-generate the certs as well. So you could pre-generate like generate them for a node and then have that node perhaps uh, uh, get that data through some secure means. So let's, let's uh, look over here and check out our nodes. So we'll run. So there isn't really any code here yet, so it doesn't do anything, so we haven't described the state of the system. But now when we look here with my fast 3G connection, there we go. So we're gonna add a class, and there's a hello world class that's already there. And then we're going to associate that class uh, with uh, the Tomcat node that we just like brought up. So like you could do this uh, textually through a, a, a site manifest, uh, which is generally how I prefer to do it, or you can use an external node classifier like the dashboard uh, to keep the data. 
So now I'm going to add this to the list of classes. Uh, So now when I run Puppet on the Tomcat node, it's, it's going to evaluate that class. So we'll do that. So here we see the notice, hello world. Yeah. I'll highlight everything so you can see what's happening on the screen. You can see it looked for plugins, it got a, a configuration, and it's doing the hello world. Um, we look back over here at the dashboard, we can see what that, what that looks like in terms of reporting. So we see everything's still all good. And when we look at the Tomcat, we can we see the number of runs and what's going on. Um, I'm going to create a class that fails, and you can see what a failure would look like. Um, So here I'm uh, installing uh, a package that I know is not going to be there. So now I'm going to add that class and associate it with the Tomcat node so it'll evaluate the fail class. Then we can see what it looks like when stuff breaks. Because uh, if you're like me, you're going to write stuff that's going to break things. Cool. So run Puppet Agent again. Give you text that you can't read. then we should watch it fail. Cool. So we can see uh, the Hello World stuff worked. And since the Hello World didn't have any dependencies on the fail, like there weren't any relationships between the two, the failure didn't keep other code from executing. Uh, so anything that you manage if, if there's an issue with one part and it relies on subsequent areas, those aren't going to be evaluated because there was a failure. Uh, but other code that you have, it's still going to evaluate that. So here we see the Hello World is still here, but now we have an error uh, the, on class fail package uh, is the resource, and that's the name of the resource, and it couldn't find it. Uh, go figure. So now let's look and see what this looks like here. We can see suddenly we have one failing. It's in bright red. It's pretty obvious that something's busticated. And we can go in there and see what failed. So, And this is just like the error we saw back on the screen. We have the error itself. And then it's correlated to the resource that we're managing, uh, and then a time. So this is great when you're working in the cloud and at scale, like you're not logged into all your machines, right? Um, in fact, once I got Puppet going on systems, uh, I didn't SSH into hosts. Like the only time you SSH into hosts when something really odd and peculiar was was uh, like happening, and then you wanted to do like some forensics to see why. But other than that, like uh, this, this, this sort of breaks that model of connecting to your host through SSH, which is not something that you, you that you need to do. Um, so, so like we'll go ahead and get that uh, fail class out of there. We, we don't want to see it keep failing all the time. And now we'll, we'll add some code for uh, Java to do a Java deployment. 
or a Tomcat rather. So uh, I got some code here uh, that another in individual wrote most stuff that's going to install uh, the Java like JDK and set up uh, like Jenkins. So we'll go ahead and add those. And while I'm adding them here, you can add them um, with these with these commands. You could add them uh, like programmatically. So we'll give that a shot. Nope. So go ahead and add uh, all these classes for the module to our external node classifier. And we'll go ahead and associate those with the node. So we won't do Jenkins just yet, but we'll set up Tomcat and the service in Java. And then we'll run the agent again. And see it actually set up Tomcat for us. So my EC2 micro instances aren't very fast. There we go. So we can see it's setting up um, that for us. And so it just installed all the Tomcat business as well as gave us the hello world again. So now let's uh, do another uh, SSH like tunnel. Tomcat should be running on port 8080 on that system. So we see we've got Tomcat like going. So that all got set up uh, automatically for us. And now we'll deploy Jenkins. Jenkins is a uh, uh, from Hudson, it's just a uh, Java app does continuous integration. Before we do that, I'll show you what the Jenkins code looks like. So the Jenkins code is including the Tomcat and Tomcat like service code. Um, it's installing a package called Jenkins, and it's requiring that a few things be done first, which is to uh, set up a yum repo and install a, a, a repo key. Um, so here we see file statements that are setting up uh, the repository. And then similar ones for deploying the war. Um, the war file gets stuck somewhere else, and then we're creating a symbolic link. So this is pretty common if you're deploying like web apps to deploy your web app uh, to some like versioned area on the file system, and then do an atomic symlink to that, whether it's Java war files or 
whatever application uh, like you're running. That's a, a pretty standard like practice. Yeah, so we didn't specify. So here I'm using, I'm on a Red Hat system, so I'm setting up the repository for it. So if this was already in my repository uh, for the system, then yeah, and that's, that's a better way to manage it, is to set up a repository. So you'd have some custom like repo, and then you would just install, uh, install Jenkins. Let's see, okay. So now we see it's setting up that repository, it's installing the, uh, the GPG key for that, and then pulling down the Jenkins software. albeit a little bit slowly for us. So then we see it was created and deployed. Now we can go and ensure that it's actually there. And we should see the butler looking guy. Again, I apologize for my uh, blazingly fast 3G connection. I'll have to see what's going on with the wireless here. There we go. So you can see it's uh, like loading up, so we were able to deploy the web app. Um, could, could somebody bring the lights back up again? Right on. Like, does anyone have uh, like questions about uh, deploying deploying apps infrastructure with Puppet? Uh, like comments for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would uh, check out uh, GarrettHoneycutt.com. You can see public speaking, and I did a talk on change management, and so I won't go through all of that here, but uh, I've got a, a talk with slides up to check out. Um, ch change management with Puppet isn't so much a technical problem as it is just understanding, understanding what that flow like should be but there's ways you can use your version control system uh, in line with Puppet and a, and a ticketing system so that uh, change comes in through a, a ticketing system. You create a topic branch in your code to just address like what's there. You can get that merged like back in, uh, create a tag and then propagate those tags throughout, like throughout your code and do like change management that way. Cause that's, that's like huge for, uh, for people to know, you know, what's like what's going on. I mean, just building and maintaining systems, okay, but you have to know like how does that change make it through, right? Mm -hmm. so, so there's there's a few approaches like you do with that. One is uh, you can set your module path just like any other path like statement. So you set up multiple paths to look in for your puppet code and it'll stop on the first one like that it sees. So you can do something like that and then check those out so that each organization can put stuff there. Then you can arrange the hierarchy. Uh, the other way is just have 
the, uh, the different organizations, you know, having their own like modules and then you pull in the right ones that you want in your one like module path. But there's uh, like definitely ways that like you can work to collaborate like with others and have, you know, different teams uh, responsible for different parts of the systems. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and, and, and you have to conform to that uh, like policy. In fact, uh, the uh, like the DoD uh, like published uh, like puppet code. I forget the standard it is for their workstations, but they have like a, a a security baseline standard, and so they used like puppet to enforce that. Like you read through the code, and it's all you know. This ensures compliance with section you know two dot three dot five dot zero of you know like some policy thing. So yeah, folks are like doing that. Right on. Like any other questions, or comments, fun things you're doing with Puppet? That was from an RPM, and I uh, actually would recommend that all the software you install uh, go through a, a, a package-like system. So roll your own packages for whatever your operating system is. Uh, that way you're doing everything the same way and you can manage them all through managing your repositories. And so now you can manage your releases by managing what's in your repository. Um, yeah. There's like a little upfront cost having to build those, but then you can automate, you know, those those builds. Um, and it's it's well worth your time to not have to have these different ways for getting software onto a system. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Sure. So there's there's multiple ways to handle different environments. So different environments might be uh, like the, the the simplistic one is let's say you have dev QA and and production, and so there's there's different ways that you can handle uh, dealing with different environments uh, depending on what your constraints are. So if if all of your systems can all talk to each other. Um, then you can use Puppet environments, and what it does is you basically specify a flag in the on on all the agents that say I'm in environment QA, and then when they talk to the Puppet master, it says Oh, you're in the QA environment, so I'll give you the module path and site manifest that's specific for those systems. So basically, it has different paths uh, to the set of code uh, for each of the environments. Um, I started using Puppet in a uh, 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 telecommunications atmosphere where none of the environments could route to the other environments. And I actually uh, think that's a much better way to set up uh, pre-production environments. Um, it's a lot more of a headache, but you never have the problem of, oh shit, my dev systems just hammered a production API because they can't talk to anything. Um, so that's the way that I like to do things coming from that environment. but. If, if, if you go that route, then like what I do is I run separate puppet masters in each environment. So there's definitely pros and cons to each. Uh, yeah. Cool. Like any other questions? Uh, I don't understand the mirroring repositories. Yeah, totally. Yep. Yeah, and so that's not that's not necessary for Puppet to have your repos done like locally, but it's definitely best practices because. Uh, like without like versioning your repositories, like let's say you want to take your systems back to last week, so you have all the code and you're reprovisioning with another you know tag of your code, but now they're going out to these RPMs that are, have all like been upgraded since last week, so now you like you can't really get that state back, and so uh, 
that and, uh, so that's like a, a good reason to have your own like like repos. But yeah, I mean you could programmatically say based on your environment use these like repos and manage it that way. And lots of folks like do that. Yeah. What's that? Um, what I've done is use uh, tools like Spacewalk. I've also done it through just having uh, like symlinks. So I say, you know, this is the version, and then it actually symlinks to some like timestamps like copy. So I might have, you know, uh, you know, one. Uh, let's say custom like repo that has all the all the packages that I had to hand roll and all that stuff, and so it looks in that one place and then it sim links off because like the problem is either uh, and this is really operating system agnostic with with like repos either you change all your agents to look in some other place or you change it on where they're like looking so like generally I do that with uh, uh, like sim links then you can use programs like hard links so that you don't have you know, physical like copies of that file like 20 times, like using up all your disk space. Um, those things help. Yeah. I also like to write change logs for them so, so I know why I did things. Cool. Yeah. How, uh, how straightforward are those things? You know, say you've got some tools or changes and you want to change this and give it to the back or the rest. How straightforward is the process of that? So, rollbacks honestly are, are almost impossible because um, like it's not yesterday so um, but if, if, if your data if, if you could also roll back your data which is generally the hardest thing and you know all your packages you could do the code as well and do that although uh, really the preferred thing to do is to roll forward and it's to you know fix the problem and go forward yeah wow that's annoying huh Like any other uh, like, like questions, uh, tales of puppet infrastructures that you might run, cool things you've seen with it. Right on. Well, uh, like thanks everybody for uh, like coming out. Uh, thanks again to cloud.com uh, for having me here. I'm speaking tomorrow morning, uh, but, but I'm gonna be speaking on the same thing. So uh, you saw me today, go see somebody else tomorrow. Um, if you're, interested in learning more about Puppet, I'm doing a one-day tutorial on Sunday. So from uh, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., uh, I'm going to give out the training materials that we generally charge a couple grand to come to and see, and you'll get those for free. Uh, and our training is generally a three-day thing like that I teach. I'm going to be condensing it down into one day, uh, but you should walk away with uh, two VMs that you're able to run like Puppet on. So uh, that's going on on Sunday. All right, well, thanks everybody. What about this? I can help with like it. We have the same problem. What would happen if you did this? this? You gave me a I good found idea. a problem. How do you do that? that? It's like this. Well, I disagree with it. Really cool would have thought of that. Let's put the word out.
As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.